Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. All right. All right. I will not let that afternoon doldrums <laughs> afflict this group. <laughs> You're in for a treat. Robert Mays and Suzanne Mays have been studying near-death experiences for the last six years and would like to present us with the theory of physical interaction in NDE that explains NDE after effects. Robert is retired from IBM. Suzanne is a music practitioner and I think you're going to enjoy this presentation. So, Robert, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, this is work that we've been doing, as um, Scott said, for, for about six years. We have uh, our website, if you're interested in more information about our work, selfconsciousmind.com. Uh, when we, we started our research, um, we, we took the NDE as the archetypal phenomenon of the relationship of the mind to the body. And uh, so you know what an NDE is. Um, you have a physical trauma or shock, and the mind separates or at least appears to separate from the body and operate independently. And then you return to the body and there are after effects. Uh, the locus of consciousness appears to separate and operate independent of the brain. It is in a particular position in space with a particular visual perspective. There is heightened uh, lucid awareness, logical thought process, in, and memory, which really means that all of the cognitive functions that we associate with the human being are present in the NDE and belong, in our view, to the mind that has separated from the body. And one of the supporting bits of evidence is the vivid perceptions that include veridical perceptions of the surroundings. So our theory has six, six basic um, parts. Uh, and we first uh, published this in 2008 in the Journal of Near-Death Studies and also made a presentation in 2010 with an expansion of that. The human being consists of an energetic, spatially extended, non-material mind that is united with a physical body. Point two is that the mind is non-material but is like a structured energy field that interacts with physical processes and thus has physical attributes. The the mind is united with the brain and interacts directly with it probably by electrical interactions with brain neurons. And um, you'll see in our talk about the interactions this characteristic of electrical um, or this electrical character to the that are that's associated with NDE interactions. Uh, and the mind is basically occupying the same space as the brain and the physical body. It's, it's united, integrated. Um, but the mind is what is the seat of conscious experience. When we are united with the body, we, it requires neural electrical activity to be conscious. And so there must always be, now this diagram has the brain here and the mind here, but really they are together. But when there's neural activity in the brain, then in the mind there is evoked conscious awareness. And as a mental agent, the mind can initiate brain activity here through volition, mental effort and such, and produces electrical brain activity, which we then, through this path, become aware of. So we make a decision, there's electrical activity, we become aware of our decision. It's a little anomalous that way, you wouldn't think, you'd think if you make a decision, you would be immediately conscious, but when you're united with the brain, you are not conscious of anything unless there's electrical activity. Uh, now, when brain structures are damaged, um, you have a stroke or there's been some, some trauma to the brain, the 
faculties that are dependent upon them are totally, partially or totally impaired. So if there is a uh, problem with a d destruction of the occipital lobe, then the there is no neural activity. Uh, it's blocked. It basically, it can't happen. And the mind receives no neural activity of that sort, and you have no conscious awareness. Um, so you're blind, or you're partially blind. And um, the mind has an internal structure because of that, okay? Because the neural activity is um, absent, that inf implies that there's a very uh, intricate connection between the mind and the brain. If you destroy a certain very small part of the brain, then, for example, you, use color, you, you lose color perception uh, in that particular part of the visual field. But it's a very small part. So the mind has to be as intricately uh, or co as complex as the structure of the brain cells for that to occur. So we say that the mind has an internal structure corresponding to the neural structures in the brain and throughout the body. Now, throughout the body, it's possible that you can have phantom limbs, where a person has lost a limb, you can see it there, and uh, has the sensation of uh, a, th that their arm or, and hand are still there. So the question is, and, and this is really a, a, a fundamental question, how does a non-material mind interact with the physical brain? And so is there physical interaction? That's the first part. Well, our consciousness shifts location, but it is still a localized independent, has a localized independent existence with a particular location and visual perspective. And um, many in the ears uh, experience they have a body and uh, the body sometimes appears luminous to them and, and to other end ears uh, and translucent or cloud-like. And, um, and at least some end ears, the body appears to have an intricate luminous structure. And in particular, uh, Raymond's book, 1988, um, a, a person, a man who was uh, in NDE, looked at his arm and hands, noticed that he had the whorls of the um, fingerprint, and noticed that the hands were composed of light with tiny structures in them and tubes of light run, uh, coming up his arms. So now, many NDEers, particularly if you're having a, an experience, a, a vertical experience in the let's say the earthly realm, you, um, you will report, report seeing vertical um, perceptions with normal colors dependent upon the ambient light. So there must be some interaction with light for you to get the colors right and to, to, um, and to get the uh, shapes and so on. And if the light is low, you can't see as well. So you're interacting with light. Likewise, and the ears uh, sometimes uh, hear uh, machine sounds like heart monitors beeping and fluorescent lights humming and so on, and, and therefore there must also be an interaction with sound waves, that is, the vibrations uh, in, in the air. And not always, not, in fact, it's, it's relatively rare. Uh, but there is it, frequent enough uh, reports that the uh, an end ear feels a slight resistance uh, or a change of denseness in passing through objects. You go through a wall, you feel a little resistance, or you feel some sort of difference in density. And or uh, end ears report they can bob against the surface of the ceiling, or can feel the support of the hospital roof when they're standing on it and um, they can touch and feel an object and sense the texture of it by touch. So these are all indications of interactions with the atoms and molecules in matter. And some of the more um, unusual interactions 
uh, NDEers can be seen by other NDEers when more than one uh, person is out of their body, usually an accident that involves more than one person. And, um, and they um, also have, usually also have a bodily form. And uh, apparently, and ears, body can be seen by animals. And uh, Jerry Casebolt had an NDE at age seven, and um, he hovered just above, above and just out of reach of a dog in the playground. Um, and uh, the dog was wagging his tail, jumping up and barking at him. And they kind of formed a dance. Um, wherever he went, the dog would go. So the dog was pretty clearly seeing him. And uh, now the question is, is that light or, or is, it, is it physical light or is it some other form of light? Um, there's other evidence that it is physical light. Um, and then the interaction with an in-person body, which is felt. So an end ear can feel the interaction uh, with another person's physical body. So in, in a, a cardiac arrest, an end ear, this was with Raymond, um, he was trying to insert a, a, an IV and she was saying, no, don't do that, I'm fine. And she pressed her arm, passed into her, she was trying to move his arm, keep, keep him from putting it in. Um, and um, she said it felt like rare, a very rarefied gelatin consistency with an electric current running through it. And that's one of the things I want you to know. An electric current, it felt electric. Um, and again, we come back to Jerry Casebolt. Another part of the hospital, he saw a woman with dementia who was causing a disturbance to the other patients. So he tickled the woman uh, on her nose just by touching her once, and she sneezed. And, and then, of course, she was quiet for a while, and everybody was relieved. And then he did it again, because she started acting up again, and then he did it a third time, until the angel that was with him said that that was enough playing around. <laughs> that, yeah, that's what the story says. There's an apparent interaction with fog. This is uh, uh, from PMH. Thank you very much. Um, it's in her new book and uh, also some additional details that she gave us. Um, there was a man driving outside Portland. Uh, it was foggy, it was cold, it was around midnight, and uh, he swerved on black ice and crashed into a tree and severed his arm and he was bleeding to death. He was out of his body, he saw the accident in detail, he knew he was going to die if he didn't get help. He went to an adjacent uh, ho a house nearby and um, and outside the second story window, he jumped up and down and shouted, call the police, there's been an accident. He did this a number of times. Now inside the house, the man who later told the police said that the fog outside his window was jumping and seemed to have the shape somewhat like that of a person. And, um, and then the man heard in both ears, according to the account, that there had been an accident and he went outside and found the wreck and, and the man obviously survived, although he lost his arm. <coughs> and there's more to that story by PMH's book. Um, book? It's her latest book, The Near-Death Experiences, The Rest of the Story. It's in the bookstore. Okay. A most interesting form of interaction is merging with an in-body person. We have found three of these cases in the literature uh, where the end of ear appears to merge, their body appears to merge with that of another person's physical body and apparently they can communicate information. So uh, um, Melvin Morse uh, reported a five-year-old who was suffering meningitis went briefly went into his sister's head as he was being taken away in the ambulance and saw the world through her, her eyes. Uh, there was uh, Bruce Grayson and Nancy Bush uh, reported a case where a 48-year-old man was despondent and attempted suicide by hanging. 